So let's uh, play the video. I'll play you Michael Nose's video. It's up a minute 50. I might play throughout. Just just let it run. Um, I might stop it. Who knows? Right? Um, and, uh, and then we'll talk about it. Um, and again, today will be history. We're talking history, culture, civilization, philosophy, ideas, and, and, and progress in history. The, 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 what, what happens in history, how history evolves, the role, maybe most importantly, the role of ideas in history. So here is, let's see if I can get this, right? There's Michael Knowles. And um, I'm going to play, um, oh, I should put my headphones on so I can hear it. Let me know it, uh, on the chat if it's too loud, too soft. Um, uh, any, any, any other comments you have, uh, you can use the chat to let me know. All right. Here we go. Play. Americans are as conservative today as they were back in 2012, which is fine and it's a good start given how much more liberal the country had become since 2012. But if 2012 is the end point, then we might as well pack it in, guys. I do not want America to be as socially conservative as it was in 2012. I want our civilization to be as socially conservative as we were in 1220. Okay, I forget it. I don't even want the 1950s. I don't even want the 1880s. I want 1220. I think that would be a good spot to land at. I want, at the very least, I think we ought to be as conservative as we were before all the modern ideologies started corroding our civilization. Because that's been the big problem. The reason that a lot of people for a long time became more socially conservative, more open, more tolerant, is because they had the pillars of our civilization to rely upon. The church, the family, the productivity, the political order, the institutions, the system of law. We had all of that to rely upon. And so we were just, we were just leaning on that while we were indulging in an ideology that was eroding all of that. This is the thing about liberalism, is liberalism, including the old classical liberalism, it's just like an acid that you pour onto your civilization. And you, I don't know, maybe you like it, maybe it's like lysergic acid, you know, maybe it's like a drug or something. People kind of like this acid for a while, but it just starts to eat away at, at the thing upon which it must uh, rest. All right, so there is a lot there, a lot there, um, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to break it down. I probably should have stopped it, but I took some notes. Um, there's a lot there, but I, I want to start with the 2020. Tw sorry, I want to start with 12. Uh, we'll mainly focus on 1220, but I also want to talk about you know all this modern ideology. Uh, you know, notice that he's dismissing classical liberalism as part of this new modern ideology, so we'll get to what the source of that is. So what's he really about? Uh, what's he really about? And, and I got a lot of the comments I got on Twitter was, well, he doesn't really mean 2020, 1220. I can't even say 1220, 1220. He, he, he just means more conservative in the past, but he repeats 1220 twice. And not only does he repeat it twice, um, he elaborates on, on what he's talking about. And maybe he doesn't mean 1220, maybe he means 1009, or maybe he means 1310. But he clearly means Middle Ages culture. He clearly means the social conservatism. And he, and he emphasizes social conservatism. So not, you know, he's not giving up his iPhone. We'll get to that in a minute. So social conservatism of the, um, uh, of, of, of the 1220s. Now, Scott already in the chat is defending him. And this is typical, right? Because, because there's, a, there's a segment of people who follow me who cannot ever criticize the right, who cannot ever see anything evil, and this is evil, what he says, evil on the right. Uh, they, 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 they find that as an attack somehow on their own values. We saw that in people defending, you know, defending Christianity when I did the Christianity versus uh, Christianity and woke and, and everything else. It's just, it's stunning to me, stunning how they cannot even see it. They, they, they refuse to see it. Right. 
And of course, sure, this is hyperbole. But hyperbole for what? What is he actually advocating for? He knows exactly what he's doing. I, I mean, he's dismissing modern ideology. We'll talk about modern ideology means. And he's dismissing classical liberalism. And he's telling you exactly what he wants people to rely on. What are the pillars of civilization for him? So it's not really hyperbole. This is exact. Oh, he, Scott says he's only one man. <laughs> Yep, and all the people who justify him and the people who employ him and the people who watch him and the people who follow him and the people who cheer him and the people who support him. This is the new right. This is modern conservatism. This guy is huge, popular. One man. It's always only one man. Always only one man. Um, all right. <laughs> so what was like, what, what is he pining for? Um, we're talking here about 1220. Basically, he's pining for the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages is a period in which the family was a family. Oh, except... Once in a while, the aristocrat, the lord who, who ruled over the, these peasants, would maybe want to sleep with your wife on the wedding night before you did. I forget what they called that. But, but generally, the family was the family, right? There was a, 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 a man and there was a woman and there was no confusion between them. Whew, God. I mean, the amount of time I know all of you spend every day on, on dealing with the confusion between men and women, I know is, is tiring to you. So it was very relaxing to know that there were men and women basically if you were gay you you, <laughs> you kept it serious you kept it silent you join a monastery or you were like stoned to death right or you were you were killed in some way because that's the penalty in those days for actually being discovered as gay although somehow the monks in the monastery got away with it uh without it there's a there's a fabulous book you know, there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, rewriting of history going on right now. There's a lot of people trying to defend the Middle Ages, trying to say the Dark Ages were not dark, the Middle Ages were not bad. Uh, there's no big difference between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. There's no real shift. Um, they're trying to say that the, the Middle Ages were just just pretty good. People people had great lives. Um, and and the, generally, the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages have got a bad rap. That is generally modern scholarship. It is driven primarily by, by religious scholars, but, but the left joins in because the left doesn't want to be judgmental. And after all, in, 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 the, in the Middle Ages, people were a lot more environmentally responsible. There were a lot fewer cows polluting with methane. There was no coal. There was no industry. And, and every everything you ate was organic so how can anybody be a great how, how can anybody be against um against the middle ages i guess i guess nobody can on the left so but the left and the right have a have a vested interest in supporting this uh and and there is this this scholarship now that that keeps coming out uh about this now I, so i want to recommend a, a book to you that i think is is excellent that that, that i think is the it really gives the sense of what the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, Middle Ages were like. It only spends one chapter on that because then it moves on to kind of what what it what the Renaissance meant and how the transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance happened and 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 what that break was, or as he calls it in the book, the shattering, and and what that looks like. And it's I think it's written from a relatively individualistic perspective, a rational perspective. Um, so it's called a, 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 a whoops. The light here is not very good, but maybe like that. A World Lit Only by Fire by William Manchester. It's one. Of, it's a really, really good book, one of the best history books you'll read. It'll really, really, um, uh, it'll really, really, I think, uh, uh, you'll learn a lot about history, about what was actually going on and from a, from a, 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 a really good perspective. But, but let's think about uh, life back then and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, I want to read you a couple of short segments that have to do more, I guess, with the intellectual, spiritual side of this period. Um, 
you know, this is uh, this is this is before Thomas Aquinas, before the Renaissance. Um, this is a time of feudalism. Most people were serfs. Now, twelve twenty is a time where things are getting a little bit better. No question. Uh, like the Dark Ages are over. The Dark Ages from about four hundred to uh, I don't know uh, about a thousand uh, are really really bleak. That is the the complete destruction of the Roman Empire. It's it's a fragmentation. Uh, it, you know, uh, um, Charlemagne is is like the peak of that period uh, up to the eleventh century, and um, Charlemagne was illiterate. Like he was the and w was illiterate. Um, so this is a slight improvement over that. Uh, there, there's some universities, Oxford, uh, University of Paris. There's a little bit, the beginnings of the discovery of Aristotle. So there's, a, there's some questioning, not too much, because uh, this is still a period in which if you question, you're killed. And, and uh, you know, if you question and, and act on it, a lot, of, a lot of purification is being done of the church. A lot of people who, and, and it's interesting because most of the people being killed during this period We've already got all the pagans who become Christian, but now people who take Christianity a little too seriously, like have vows of poverty and things like that as communities and, and say that the church and, and, and the pope are corrupt, they're basically slaughtered, they're, they're butchered. Right? So this is, this is a period of immense violence, violence on a local scale and violence on a kind of a, a not international scale because there was no international, but on, on a... On a, on a uh, uh, well, an international scale, because this is a period of the of the Crusades. This is a period where the Crusades often fail. So in 20-something, 2012, 12-something, 12, 12 uh, the Crusades try to go to Jerusalem. They fail. So on their way back, they figure they're pissed off. They're not happy. They've just failed. So they go to Constantinople, um, which is basically Christian at this point, and they sack the place and slaughter everybody. And they're basically slaughtering Christians, right? They're no problem in killing left and right and, and everybody and everybody else. So uh, it, it's, a, it's an unbelievable period of violence. So to the extent that you consider, you know, uh, socially conservative equals violence, then you, you got it. The, the, this is a period of, of immense violence. And if social conservatives consider that, as, as something good, then, then so be it. it. It is a period in which the Crusades, in order to fund the Crusades, in order to just warm up, slaughter people on the way to Palestine and, and steal their stuff so that they could fund um, uh, their, their going over and trying to capture Jerusalem from the Arabs and from the Muslims. But again, you know, slaughtering is going on on a, on a wide scale, particularly if you are considered some kind of apostate to Christianity. Um, Indeed, in the Dark Ages, uh, you know, people talk about Islam having converted uh, much of the, what today is the Arab world uh, by the threat of the sword, <laughs> as if Christianity didn't do that. I mean, the Christians traveled all over Europe and converted people with the sword. You either converted Christianity or you don't. Charlemagne did this, I think, uh, I think um, to the Saxons. He basically said, you either convert to Christianity right now, you're baptized, or we kill you, and they said, "Nah, we don't. We, we, we don't want to convert." And he killed forty-five. He literally cut off the heads. He decapitated forty-five hundred people in one day. I don't know how you even do that. I don't know what the logistics of that are, of killing that many people in one day by beheading. I mean, beheading is not easy. So anyway, maybe that's a, maybe that's exaggeration. Maybe it took them three days. But the point is, they killed forty-five hundred people in one day. Why? because they wouldn't convert to Christianity. So don't tell me Islam is this brutal religion where, where, where they converted everybody with the sword. Christianity of that period was exactly the same. This is a period in which people are, are poor. Uh, most people are, are still uh, subsistent farmers, um, usually to uh, uh, farms that are owned, owned in, in quotation marks because it's not real ownership, by, uh, by lords, by, by aristocrats, um, and, uh, and who are, you know, most people are serfs. In, they are now towns. The towns might have um, uh, craftsmen. It's interesting that if you read now, I, I looked at the Britannica history of this period, and if you read the Britannica history, it's like, this is an era of growing economy, of increased wealth, of industry, and you go, really? 
you know, industry in the 19th century sense, because we're reading this in 20, in, 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 in um, what is it now, 2023. So industry has a certain ring to it. No, of course not. It's little craft shops. It's little, it's, 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 it's little two, one, two man operations. This is not industry. And rising standard of living, rising uh, productivity, not in the sense of the 19th century or the 20th century. This is from 12, you know, over a thousand years, barely any increase in real wealth, in real production, in real increased standard of living. And think about how low things got in the dark ages so that the middle ages looks like a big improvement. This is an era of, of uh, physical material, uh, you know, horror. Um, but it is also a period in which, um, it is also a period where spiritually uh, there's really no art. Um, most people aren't exposed to any art. The art that exists is purposefully ugly, gargoyles, monstrous, and Jesus is on a cross. But even the Jesus, there's no anatomically correct Jesus. There's no anatomy. There's just the, the symbolism of what, of what Jesus would be on a cross, of suffering, of hatred, of, 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 of pain. That's what is, this period conveys. This is a period of darkness, of suffering, and of horror. People are unbelievably superstitious. Faith dominates all discussions. Christianity is the law, although there's the beginning of the study of Roman law in, in, in some of the, the centers and even the beginning of analysis of Aristotle in places like the University of Paris, but these are the exceptions. This is a few people. It's still true that the vast majority, vast majority of people are illiterate. They can't read. They will never be able to read throughout their lives. This is a by the standards of 2023, this is like one of the worst periods in human history. Like the Romans were better off, the Greeks were better off, and within three, 300 years, Europeans are better off with the Renaissance. The Arabs are better off. Um, uh, the Arabs are better off from 900 to 1200 uh, AD. They're better off. The, the Chinese are better off. Most of the, a lot of their history, they're better off. They're, they're, you know, this is not a good period. As I said, there's almost no art. There's some poetry. There's some, uh, there's some poetry going on. A little bit after uh, 1220, and, and I wonder if, if Knowles just made up 1220 or if, or if he was targeting the same. I, I don't know. But a little bit after this is Thomas Aquinas, so you get the beginnings of thought, philosophy, but during this period, there's zero. There's, there's one philosopher um, uh, uh, during this period. Uh, I mean, this is 100 years earlier, but basically uh, uh, similar. Uh, Bernard of Claveau, Claveau, right? The most influential Christian of his time bore deep distrust of the intellect and declared that the pursuit of knowledge, unless sanctified by a holy mission, was a pagan act and therefore vile. Vile. The pursuit of knowledge was vile. Um, and, you know, this is the beauty of, of the book by um, Manchester. Whoops, the light here was terrible. Um, William Manchester. Um, you know, it really encourage you to read it. Uh, here's another element of this that has to do with um, arts, uh, personal values, um, kind of uh, personal responsibility, uh, inspiration, conservative, 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 uh, social conservative, socially of society. This is this is interesting. Um, the most baffling, elusive, and yet in many ways, I'm reading for the book, and and in many ways, the most significant dimension of the medieval mind um, were invisible and silent. One was the medieval man's total lack of ego. Now, I think this is what Knowles and maybe Matt Walsh really, really like. Although, of course, they have big egos. But other than that, the total lack of ego. Even those with creative powers had no sense of self. 
each of the great soaring medieval cathedrals, our most treasured legacy from that age, required three or four centuries, three or four centuries to complete. Canterbury was 23 generations in the making. 23. Uh, Chartres, a, a former Druic center, 18 generations. Yet, I mean, maybe, maybe not yet, maybe because, we know nothing of the architects or builders. They were glorifying God. To them, their identity in this life was irrelevant. Noblemen had surnames, but fewer than 1% of the souls in Christendom were, quote, well-born. Typically, the rest, nearly 60 million Europeans, were known as Hans, Jacques, Saul, Carlos, Will, or Will's wife, or Will's son, or Will's daughter. If that was inadequate or confusing, a nickname would do. Because most peasants lived and died without leaving their birthplace, there was seldom need for any tag beyond one eye, or Rosie the redhead, or, beyond, or Blondie, or the like. These villages were frequently innominate for the same reason. If war took a man even a short distance from a nameless hamlet, the chances of his return to it were slight. He could not identify it, and finding his way back home was virtually impossible. Each hamlet was inbred, isolated, unaware of the world beyond the most familiar local landscapes, a creek or mill or tall tree scattered by lightning, scarred by lightning, sorry. There were no newspapers or magazines to inform the common people of great events. Occasional pamphlets might reach them, but they were usually theological. And like the Bible, they were always published in Latin, a language they no longer understood, even if they could read it. Between 1378 and 1417, this is 100 years later than uh, Noel's ideal, Pope Clement VII and Benedict XIII reigned in Avignon, excommunicating the other popes from Rome, who excommunicated them right back, yet the toiling peasantry was unaware of the estrangement in, 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 in the church. Who would have told them? The village priest knew nothing himself. His archbishop had every reason to keep it quiet. The folks were baptized, shriven, attended mass, received the host at a communion, married and received the last rites, never dreaming that they should be informed about great events let alone have any voice in them. Their an anonymity approached the absolute. So did their mute acceptance of that. That's what they want. No Twitter. No, none of this. And of course, a life expectancy, I don't know, of 29, half your kids dying before the age of 10. No technology, no wealth. Now, some people said, wrote to me and said, wait, 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 wait a minute. Michael knows is talking about social conservatism. He still wants the wealth. But this is where this is a, worse than a fantasy. This is a, a, a massive evasion. Where does the wealth come from? What led to the wealth that we have today? What led to the non-anonymity of individuals today? What led to... Twitter and, 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 you know, iPhones and everything we have today. What led to the, to the modern standard of living that they want to preserve while having the barbaric culture of 1220? Oh, by the way, I, I, I didn't even mention that, uh, you know, I should have, 1220, and, and this, I think, is what, what really appeals to Knowles and Matt Walsh. Women could not own property. Women were basically uh, slaves to their husbands. They, 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 they won nothing. They had no rights. They had, I mean, men didn't have rights, but women certainly didn't have rights. They were below. So what led, what led to all the, 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 the wealth that we had today, all the success that we had today? What, what meant to it is modern ideology. You know, and this is what Knowles is complaining about. What led to it, because he says, what I want is social conservatism before all modern ideology. Well, what is modern ideology? You say the individual mind, the individual ambition, but what made individual ambition possible? What made the individual mind 
fertile, efficacious in the world. Where did it come from? How did it happen? Just a fluke? It's just an accident that, you know, if, 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 if we'd only kept the social conservatism of 12, 12, 12, 20, whatever the hell that even means, yeah, we'd still be wealthy today. I mean, that is such ignorance of history. The Middle Ages ends with a revolution, an intellectual revolution, evolution of the mind, a revolution of the individual. It takes that revolution a few more centuries to actually manifest fully in the culture, which then leads to increased wealth. But it happens, you know, 200 years after 1220. It happens sometime in the 1400s. Exact dates don't really mean much here. And that's called the Renaissance. And what is the Renaissance? The Renaissance is a renaissance. It's a rediscovery and a reintroduction and a reliving of what? Of Greece and Rome, of Aristotle, of beautiful sculptures of individuals. And now, now you have great art. Now you have great art that's not, you have art that's available to all people. Michelangelo's David is out in public. Everybody can enjoy him in, Ven in uh, Florence. You have art that's displayed everywhere. And you have a beginning of a recognition of individuals. Still, most people are serfs. Still, most people are ignorant. Still, most people are illiterate. But it's the beginning and yes, certain things happened in the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas predominantly, that led to the Renaissance. So it's not that Renaissance came out of nowhere, of course not. It's those first studying Aristotle in the University of Paris by people like Abelard. Abelard's a great story like of Middle Ages. I don't know if you know that. If you don't know the story of Abelard and Eloise, you should know it. And there's a good movie about it, which I forget the name of. But... Um, you know, Abelard has, has this affair with uh, Louise and, and, and as a consequence, as a sexual relationship with her, and as a consequence is, is, well, I won't tell you what happens. Watch the movie or read up about it. And then, you know, so, so you, you, you get a renaissance. And a renaissance is the introduction, the beginning of the introduction of modern ideas. Modern ideas about art, modern ideas about the intellect, the, the, the individual, modern ideas about the secular, about the secular, maybe even modern ideas about sexuality. Ugh, I know, rough, but it's probably the case, I don't know for certain, but it's probably the case that both uh, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci were gay. Michelangelo probably repressing that and, and suffering from guilt and everything else. And Leonardo embracing it and living it not quite in open, but relatively in open. I mean, Michael knows will be horrified by that. This is modern ideology. This, you know, it's, it's really fascinating to me how of all the issues out there, sexuality and, 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 and uh, homosexuality um, is the thing they fear the most. They're really afraid of it. They're really scared. I don't know what it says about their own sexuality or what it says about their own sense of their own manliness, but they are terrified, terrified of homosexuality and terrified. Gay pride now, pride flags are the most terrifying things in America today. That is the enemy because they are so afraid. These right-wing nuts are so afraid of that. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Brooks Show grow, 
please consider sharing our content. And of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.